It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Blaine Weaver. Hi, Blaine. How are you? Hey, how are you, sir? Doing fine. Doing fine. Thank you very much. You were actually on the show like four years ago. Do you remember that? I was. I was. I remember specifically because of uh, your marketing material. I, I, rec- I was like, oh, yeah, he interviewed me before. <laughs> <laughs> I had to look it up. But, yeah, it was uh, May of 2017 you were on the show. And you were promoting a film that you made at that point. And it's funny because I'm looking at your IMDb bio and the film's not on here. Uh, that's, uh, that needs to be updated, I guess. <laughs> D- dropping the ball. I, I need to call my publicist on that one, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because um, the film was called um, Cut to the Chase. It was Cut Cut to the Chase, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's not on this bio. But I remember the film. I watched it. I remember you got beat up a whole lot in that film. A whole lot. A whole lot. Yeah. Well, you know, Cut to the Chase was a uh, like a thriller, film noir, actiony thing, but we did it on this shoestring budget. So uh, for many reasons, I decided when I was writing the script that really the only person who gets beat up the whole time should be me, just so we make sure that nobody gets hurt but me. <laughs> so uh, it was really uh, me as the director and producer watching my own back. Well, I just beat me up so nobody else gets hurt. <laughs> Yeah, as I remember, you seem to be uh, walking around in that film most of the time with a broken nose, and <laughs> it was exactly uh, yeah. So you're uh, promoting another film now, a new one called Getaway. That's right. That's right. Getaway, a uh, horror slasher film. Ah, okay. Uh, I apologize. I have not seen this one. I've just been a little bit busy and uh, didn't have a chance to sit down and watch it. So. Uh, well, I guess that's good news in one sense that uh, there's no chance I could spoil it if there's any. <laughs> exactly. And it is that kind of movie. It does have a, a very twisty uh, plot that uh, I think there are lots of spoilers to it. So so thank you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when you say horror slasher film, is this uh, reminiscent of, you know, the 80s kind of Halloween um Nightmare on Elm Street or any of those sort of classic ones? Very much so. Very much so. It's a. It's very much an homage or, you know, a, a throwback to a Halloween or a Friday the 13th. Um, it's uh, basically, it's about um, this uh, group of college students are going off into the woods to, uh, to a campground in the woods to shoot a short horror film for their film class. And uh, they get out there in the middle of nowhere, and uh, the horror becomes very real, and it's also very meta. We've got, like, they're making a movie about a horror film, and the movie itself is there, you know, but uh, it's lots of scares, lots of jumps, you know, and uh, lot, lots, of, uh, uh, lots of fake blood. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's a film about making a, it's a horror film about making a horror film. Exactly. I get it. Okay. We 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 use all the all the tropes from the you know the old the the classic slasher films that we know so well, and we play on that and you know add to it, and uh, it's it's really fun. It's a great popcorn movie, and uh, if you like to be scared and to get your jumps, this is the movie for you. Is it serious or is it a, a spoof movie like a scary movie? It's it's absolutely serious, but I think it has. You know, it has some humor in it. Like, I think all the best uh, horror films do have a nice, wry sense of humor. But not a spoof, no. Absolutely uh, playing it straight, you know, for uh, for the scares. Oh, okay. Is there a lot of sex in it? I mean, I hate to be so crude to say it like that, but... <laughs> you, you know, not, not a lot. There's a little sex. Not a lot. <laughs> because as I remember from the, uh, the 80s films, that was always as much a part of the... You know, when they said, oh, it's a teen camp, and then the the slasher comes in right. through. You know there's always going to be sex. There was always going to be a lot of sex. Absolutely. 
Well, we we don't we don't shy away from it. They, there is a little uh, you, you know sexiness in the movie, which is always fun. Um, and you know the rules are that whoever has sex first in the slasher movie gets killed first. That's I'm true. I'm not saying that happens. You know, I think but that is it true. Is, <laughs> yeah. It is a trope, and we don't shy away from those things. Hey, you got to pay for your pleasures one way or the other. Exactly, exactly. So when you do watch it. Uh, don't forget that I said that because it's a it's a clue as to who dies first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will remember that. So you've been pretty busy since uh, you were on the show last, yeah? I try to. I try to stay busy. I like making movies and you know creating new content and uh, yeah, it's my favorite thing to do. So luckily, I've had some good opportunities the last few years. Okay, so in Getaway, you're not in the movie though, right? No, I, I wrote and directed it. Oh, you wrote and directed it. Okay. We get a lot of screenwriters and people and authors who are hopeful screenwriters on this show. What kind of advice can you give for that? Because, I mean, that's such a a bizarre business to be in. Yeah, it, it is strange. And it, it's what's interesting about it is there doesn't seem to be any direct path to success. Like everybody goes a different path. Everybody's story is a little different. Um, so, uh, unfortunately my advice is pretty basic writing advice, which is to write a lot, write all the time and read all the time. Um, I think that the more content you're creating, you know, the better chance that something will break through and you'll be able to sell a script or, you know, maybe you'll make it yourself kind of thing. But, uh, just continually writing and trying new genres, I think just makes us a better writer. And then, you know, we have more stacks of scripts that when someone's looking for something, you know, you can hand it off. I know typically or traditionally screenwriters had an agent who would shop their scripts Mm -hmm. around. But, I mean, these days everything has been turned upside down with digital and DIY. And, I mean, is it viable that you can market yourself online for this? It is. It, I mean, it's a, it's a it's a very good question, and you're absolutely right. Things are very different now than they were even ten years ago. Um, ten years ago, uh, a writing a writer would get an agent who would rep them, you know, for all kinds of things. But nowadays, it's kind of become it's per script, or at least that's been my experience. You know, of like an agent will like a script that you wrote and then take it out for you, but they don't rep you for everything. Right? It's just for like what you bring them and they'll say, Oh no, I'll take this. And then they take it out to the world. Um, I'm sure there's exceptions to that rule, but uh, that's what I've found the, the last couple of years. Um, but you know, the, the writer's guild of America has a really great website that allows, you know, you to self submit for stuff. Um, and the last year there's been, you know, a, a big controversy between writer's guild and some of the agencies. So the agents have been shy to even pick anything up. So what you're saying that, that digital, self-submission thing has really spiked during all of that. And I don't know if it'll ever go back to how it was before. Uh, I would probably say not because once you've let the, uh, the animals out of the cages, <laughs> they're, they're, they're going to run loose and they're not going to come back. And, you know, the studios, <laughs> the major studios have lost so much control and power that they once had uh, with all the indie films that are coming up that uh, I don't think so. You know what I mean? It it would be interesting to see how they could possibly go back to the golden age of Hollywood. But I don't see that happening. Not not unless we blow up social media and essentially blow up the Internet. Yeah, no, I agree. The the Internet is here to stay. And, uh, you know, with it comes, you know, these changes. I, I think part of that is that exactly as you were saying, that DIY mentality that you know, I, I really like the the Renaissance man kind of idea of like, I can make my own content. I can, you know, if I want to direct my script, I can. And, you know, it takes much less money than, you know, a Paramount or Universal movie. You know, it's like I could just raise my own, make it here. And that changes everything, you know. Sure. Um, it, it's, it's very freeing. Well, and also um, not even for the Internet, for the marketing aspect of your film, but just for the technical actually creation of it, digital cameras have gotten so cheap and the quality is beautiful. With a good digital camera and good eye, you still have to know what you're doing, but you could right. make a film that 
is every bit as good as a major studio release. It just might not have all the yeah, CGI I, and, you know. It, it's really amazing what we can do these yeah. days. And, uh, like, I was talking today about my first film that I made in 2005 with a, a, a DV camera um, that wasn't HD. You know, it was, it was uh, and we were talking about at the time how cool it was that guerrilla filmmakers could actually make a feature film without, you know, spending millions of dollars. And what's hilarious is that first feature film that I did that, you know, cost, what, $200,000, $300,000, something like that. Um, that camera is not near as good as my phone now. <laughs> and I, I yeah. think that's I believe it, yeah. <laughs> well, there, there was another one I saw, too, where uh, I think it was the Apollo 11 that went to the moon. And all the computer power that was on that rocket is about half of what a phone is th today. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. But it is also amazing the kind of film that people can make on a very low budget. I mean, I saw films that were made by indie filmmakers for $50,000, $40,000 that were romantic comedies that had great mm -hmm. stories. It still comes down to the writing and I think the production and the, and the direction, don't you? In terms of what a good film Absolutely. is. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think you can apply that all the way across the board, you know, for any budget level, you know, it, it's really about the script, you know, uh, the story that you're trying to tell. And then it becomes, uh, you know, it's like a hierarchy, you know, and then it's like your, your talent and are they watchable and, you know, do people want to see them? And then you're into how you show the story. Is it a compelling, you know, exciting? Um, but the, the difference between what I do and what Steven Spielberg does is really nothing. We, we're using our style to try to tell a story, a compelling story, and it's the same elements that make a good movie. Whether you're, you know, got the top of your game and the most, you know, well-paid director in the world, or you're making a little indie movie with your iPhone. Um, but it, it's it's fun, and I love that. I love being able to make something, and you know, it being it coming out like we we, we did uh, drive-ins with Getaway. We had this really cool little rollout during. Uh, the pandemic where drive-ins were popping and we were able to put getaway in a bunch of drive-ins across the country and we were playing at the same time as tenant and it's you know it's like you can go to this screen and watch tenant or you can go over here and watch getaway and it was i love that i love the um the the equalization you know that the marketplace has of like this is a movie and so is this one which one would you like <laughs> you know well i think that's great i mean the playing field has been leveled basically and then that goes back to what we yeah. were just talking about, where it's unlikely that the studio, the major studios are ever going to go back to the golden age. Not once the playing field has been leveled, because people won't won't have it go <laughs> go back to the old way. I don't think so. Exactly. Including me. I'm not. I, you can pry this camera out of my hands. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next? What are you doing? Uh, you got a new project. How's COVID affected your ability to do film? You know, uh, obviously, uh, like everybody, it's turned everything upside down. Um, but I did, you know, I made a film right in the middle of COVID this last summer. Um, and we were one of the, we, we shot it in Virginia and we were the first movie to go in Virginia. But we were amongst the first like 50 to 100 movies nationwide that, that went in with the COVID restrictions and all that stuff. And it was crazy. I mean, it added you know, several dozens of thousands of dollars to the budget, you know, just for yeah. testing and, you know, all, all the things that you need. But we were we were getting tested, you know, three three times a week and um, we were on location. And, you know, part of location is normally like as a director, I would, you know, go out after rap with the actors and spend time with them. And there's none of that. We would just send them back to their hotel rooms and they were in this like bubble um, so nobody could really bond with the actors at all. Um, but we were able to do this uh, Christmas film uh, called Cubit for Christmas, which is coming out next year. And uh, and it was uh, we were everybody stayed healthy. Everybody stayed safe. Very surreal shooting experience. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, really satisfying. And, you know, obviously, once we were wrapped and we went a couple of weeks and we knew that nobody had gotten sick or anything you you breathe this sigh of relief and realize oh i've been so stressed and nervous about that the whole time and it's you know so nice to be like okay 
good safe shoot and uh, good, funny, charming, romantic comedy. So are you going to stick with uh, writing and directing, or are you going to do any more acting? Oh, I, I love doing acting. I actually just, uh, this year, uh, I was in this movie called American Pie Girls Rules, which is on Netflix right now, which um, I actually wrote as well. And the director, because he knows me as an actor, uh, you know, offered me this part in that film. So that was fun. Um, but yeah, I, I like to do it all, man. You know, I, I really, uh, I love to act. I love to act and direct in the same thing. Um, so it's just about what the projects are, you know? I don't like, like, for instance, Getaway is about, you know, college students. And, you know, it, it's this great ensemble of young, new actors. And there's not really a place in there for me, you know? So I, I don't feel the need to shoehorn myself into anything. But when the opportunity comes and it feels right, I, I leap at it. I was just thinking about that while you were talking about that. I was thinking about that film. Uh, I think it was called Sleepaway Camp that came out in the uh -huh, 80s. Absolutely. And, you know, you could have been like that that dirty chef guy. You know, you could have been that guy. <laughs> I could have. I could have very well. That's very true. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'll keep that in mind for the next one. <laughs> All right. Blaine, we got to wrap this up. Do you have a uh, website you want to give out for the film? I, I sure do. It's getawayhorror.com. There's a couple of different films named Getaway, so uh, looking for me by name is usually the best way to find it. Getawayhorror.com. Getawayhorror.com. All right. Blaine, thanks so much for coming back on. Nice talking to you again, and uh, best of luck with everything. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, man. Bye-bye. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, Aaron Royce. Hi, Aaron. How are you? Hi there. Thank you for having me today. Appreciate well, it. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, you are in Canada? I am in Calgary, Al snowy Calgary, Alberta. Calgary. Oh, okay. Wasn't that... Mm -hmm. uh, what was the show that they did in Calgary? The one with the big moose. <laughs> I don't know. They've done quite a few here, so and probably more than one with moose, so okay. I'm not sure which one that would be. <laughs> they film a lot of movies here because of the mountains. Right, because you're on the Rockies, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, I've never been there, but it uh, looks very beautiful. It's beautiful. It reminds me of uh, Colorado, the Rockies in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. Same kind of temperature, similar temperature. So how big of a town is Calgary, or how big of a city? How many people? I think we're upwards of a million, but I live in a community outside of, uh, out, just outside of Calgary, about 15 minutes. Oh, so okay. So ours, yeah, ours is barely a town slash teeny tiny city outside of Calgary. It's pretty spread out. Uh, winters are pretty tough up there, though, yeah? Yeah, we've had two weeks of minus... 
25.30. It just broke, so it's a balmy, I think, minus 5 today. Wow. T-shirt weather. And it's snow. Yeah. <laughs> For us, it is. Almost wear your shorts. <laughs> Another couple degrees. I know that I was in Alaska years ago, and it, it hit, well, like 30 degrees Fahrenheit, which is still below zero, right, in Celsius. Yeah. And people were literally running around in shorts and T-shirts. They thought it was just balmy. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, zero's great. And I was in Alaska, and that's one of the reasons I moved to Calgary, because I fell in love with the mountains there. And when I came home, I moved here. Um, but, yeah, zero would be like <laughs> beginning of summer for us. I suppose to segue all of this talk about weather into writing, uh, mm -hmm. all of that long, cold winter where you have to stay inside is probably good, good environment to to write. Uh, would I be correct in assuming that? You would be correct in assuming that, provided that work and children and home life, and especially this past year, weren't sitting on my shoulder at the same time. Well, yeah, but, the, the COVID is kind of... But, but here we do, we go outside. I mean, the kids were skating last week, so it has to be about minus 15, maybe 10. Um, otherwise, we're outside quite a lot. Um, skating and tobogganing and snowshoeing, we can do that too. So even in the winter, we're out as much as we can. The one thing I found interesting about the uh, conversion between Fahrenheit and Celsius is that mm -hmm. in, the, in the hotter end of the spectrum, I, I can't do it in my head. It's impossible. But once it gets below <laughs> about 15, it seems to be they start to come together like minus 25 and Celsius is around the same as minus 25 in Fahrenheit. Yeah, I think so. And I, was, I wasn't saying it right for you, too. So 30 is zero. And then it just ticks down from there. And I think it does get kind of combined. Basically, the way it's been the last couple of weeks, if you go outside and you blink, your eyelashes stick together. They get iced. Ouch. Iced up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's what minus... 25 is like usually and you can take warm water if you if you boil water and bring it outside you throw it in the air it crystallizes into ice and then hits the ground well that might be kind of fun to do but uh yeah we have to make it interesting when it's that cold i'm sure the kids enjoy doing that love it yeah <laughs> so having said all that let's move on your book is called mommy why and yes I would guess that it is a children's book, or is is it a book about children for adults? It is a children's book. It is their questions my daughter asked me over and over and over again. And to me, when I was writing it, I thought it would be a good platform for that age group, so four to six, maybe seven, for the children but for parents as well, I thought it would be a really good platform, a good uh, book that families could come together and read about questions, learn about it, and then be able to, for kids to be comfortable to ask more questions and have those conversations with their parents. That maybe they're not. Okay. What was the question that inspired the book? <laughs> um, gosh, there's quite a few in the book, but at the time, my daughter had quite a lot of questions about how she looked so compared to other people so the color of her hair um, you know why my hands were bigger than her hands why you know one of her friends would have black hair and and she didn't and she has a little she has a crooked smile and that was always a very sensitive thing for her I'm not it just always was so she would ask, you know, why is my smile like this and nobody else's? And, and, you know, why do I look this way? Why is that person that way? So it was about me trying to answer questions like that at the age that she was to help her understand that it's okay to look different. It's okay to be different and that it's a good thing and it's a special thing. And my hope was that any parent that read this with their children, that those children would feel unique, would feel special, would be feel like they could look different and it was okay. So 
those are sort of the kind of questions my daughter was asking at the same time. She asks a thousand, but those are some of the key ones. Well, wouldn't this be a boring world if we all looked exactly alike? I mean, my God. <laughs> I, I tell her that all, all the time. I don't know if this is appropriate, but it was interesting because where we live, it's very multicultural. Her classroom is a rainbow. It's great. When we were in the States in Idaho one summer, we were in a McDonald's. She was probably five, five and a half, and she was looking around and she said to me, she's like, Mommy, why is everyone here white? You don't see any other color. And I looked at her and I'm like, wow. I said, I don't know, because she's so used to, you know, and that's why she would have questions, I guess, getting as she was growing up, because all of her friends come from different backgrounds and cultures, and it was odd for her it would be odd for her to be in a location where everyone looked, you know, had the same color of skin or something right. like that. So I, I found that interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, America is very multicultural, but it depends on yep. where you go because our population yeah, is, is so much larger than Canada's. I mean, we're, what, uh, over 10 times the population here. And Huge, yeah. It's, yeah. It was funny. I was just having this conversation the other day with a, a friend of mine, and we were talking about how landmass Canada is far bigger than the United mm -hmm. States, but most of it is ice, and most of it is uninhabited. <laughs> so even though you know you have this enormous geography, you only have about thirty million people in the whole country, where we have yeah, the pop pushing four hundred million at this point. I think. Yeah, I mean the states. Honestly, I've said to my husband, it's it's amazing to me because in the United States, you have, if you want cold weather, hot weather, you have everything and all the different landscapes and I said, how amazing would that be? And all the different cultures, depending on what part of the states you go to, right. you know, the right. lives are lived differently, um, accents are completely different, landscapes are different, it's amazing. And we don't have quite that much of a difference even between provinces there are but it's not that significant i don't think well i suppose the only big issue or difference in canada would be quebec versus you know the rest of it but if you look at the history of the united states and the history of canada it's very different i don't know we, we we're getting way off topic here but i know, I know. <laughs> we could talk about that all day yeah <laughs> Okay, so, so the question she asked was, why did she look the way she did, and and how can people look different? Did you give her a DNA lesson? I mean, that would explain. Yeah, it was skin more about, color and... I mean, at the age, you, have, you can't get into too much detail, but it was an explanation of, you know, you come from mom, mommy, and you come from daddy, so you were family. So we will, because you come from us, we will look similar. We have... So in the book, you know, there's certain parts of her that are the same as my husband, of her face. Right. And so I talked to her, you know, look at my eye color. You have the same eye color as I do. And I'd look at her in the mirror and I'd say, look at her hair. It's the same color. And she's like, oh, okay. So she looked the way she did. I tried to explain it because she is a part of us. And she will look like us but still be herself. So I would say, you know, your eyes are the same color, but look at the corner there. It's more goldy than mine, so it's a little bit different. That's you. And so you are you, but you're you're also part of us, sort of how I explained it. Okay. How old is she now? <laughs> she will be 11 in April. Okay. So I assume she's graduated to more sophisticated questions at this point. Yeah. Well, she has. <laughs> the next book I was thinking of was um, Mommy, Why Not? Because they, the questions flipped. To, yes, she's older and asking more um, detailed questions and on different subjects. And not sure how I want to put that in writing yet, though. Okay. Uh, do you have another question? Give us another question from, the, uh, from this book. So she would ask me at the time, she would, she would put her hand up against mine and she would ask, you know, why is your hand bigger than me? When we would run, you know, we'd play around uh, outside and she'd ask, you know, why can you run faster than me? Why are your hands bigger than mine? Why are you taller than me? So it was explained to her that as she gets older, she will grow. She will be able to run faster than me. She will be taller than me. She's always growing. 
So it was always questions about, you know, how she looked, why she was her size, why we were wise, why we were bigger and taller and all of that sort of thing. So it was questions like that as well that that I ended up putting in the book. So why I look different, that she will, over the years, she will catch up to me and surpass me in everything that she does. What do you think she's going to want to do for a career for her life? Well, it's funny because when I started writing this, she has an amazing imagination. And so she started writing. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah, she does that. She does some drawing. Her grandmother, my husband's mother, is an amazing artist. And my daughter, she's great. She'll just sketch stuff. And, you know, she's 11, so she loses interest in things quick. But she's come up with some some great ideas. There's a couple of books that I've started, other ones that have come out of story, stories in her head that we would tell each other. So she's pretty creative that way. She's she asked me if I could uh, have a book published. I said, well, if you finish one, maybe. <laughs> Is she right or left-handed? Um, she could do both. Yeah, okay. So, and then she she's right now. I'd say from three years on, she started to write more with her right and right, and that's what she does now. Okay. Well, for some yeah. reason, if I had to have guessed, I would have said she was left-handed, but that doesn't she always... She did when she was younger. <laughs> she did when she was younger. Okay. Well, but she switched yeah. on her own, right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we used to give her pencils. She could, she would color and, and do her letters with both hands, so my husband and I just sat back and thought, well, it'll be interesting to see what she chooses. You know, as she gets older, and she just seemed to start doing it more and more with her right. That's interesting, yeah, because I don't know. I don't have children, so I don't have a reference point. But mm -hmm. it seems to me that people pick a dominant side pretty early on. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she didn't for a while, I think, I think that's great, because that's exercising both sides of the brain equally. Well, and that's what we see with her. And hopefully that continues. Um, Katie Carlson, who illustrated Mommy Why for me, she did that when she was 14. And my daughter reminds me a bit of Katie. She was, she's very creative, but she uses right and left brain. She's very, can be very analytical at the same time. And, you know, my daughter is similar. She's creative, but she's great at math and um, science and things like that, too. So it'll be interesting to see what she chooses. As she gets older. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure. So what about her crooked smile? Did she get over that? <laughs> um, much, much better. Yeah. Then um, it took her several years to feel good about herself and not let it bother her when people asked her about it. So I'd say, well, she's, she'll be 11, so maybe when she was 7, she seems more comfortable with it. I don't. But before that, I don't look at that as necessarily a bad thing. I, I kind of look at that as being something unique. And if that's she, what we told her. Yeah, and if she ever <laughs> wanted to be an actor, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a definite, a definite unique quality that they could use for a specific part. Well, we pulled up. We actually. That's funny you say that because I w pulled up actors online and I showed her. Look, they have the same smile. They have the same smile. They have the same smile. So we would do stuff like that with her, too, to show her that, you know what, it's not a big deal. Yeah. And it's different, and that's just you. So, so she used to pull her mouth to the side so it would be straight um, when she smiled. But, you know, she no longer does that. So when she smiled, so, how, do, how do you define crooked? Um, would the, her lower jaw be to the one side to the other? or No, um, on her, the left side of her mouth in the corner... There's a nerve when she was born. It wasn't connected. So what will happen is if she smiles, mostly when she's, ups if she's upset or smiling, so the one side of her lips or her mouth stays straight, just in line, and the other side dips quite a bit downwards. So it looks like it's on an angle when she smiles. To me, it's not a big deal, but it's not a straight kind of smile or straight, you know, if you're crying or something like that, it's it's tip. Okay. Because that one side will never move. It just stays there. But you can't notice it when she talks. It's only if she's emotional about something. But she notices it. It's, it's always <laughs> funny when 
I do video shows and I get responses mm-hmm. back from the guest and they always see something that I do I never see. When I do the editing, I just go through it, I do it, I put it up and they'll say, oh, I should have done this or I should have done this. I never see it. It's only people, and it's just funny because people have a completely different image of themselves than what everyone else says. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. Even if you hear yourself recorded, it doesn't right. sound like you because right. it's different to your ears. Right. Same concept. <laughs> uh, we do have to wrap this up. We are unfortunately out of time. Do you have a website that you want to give out? Sure. Um, my website is aaronderoyce.com, and it talks about the book. There's a Facebook link and a uh, there's a Twitter link, but honestly, I'm not on it very much. But yep, the website's aaronderoyce.com, and there's a Facebook link too. Okay, great. Thank you so much for coming on the well, show. It was nice talking to you. And it was nice talking to you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And best of luck with your book. Thank you.